saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We give thanks to God. Um, it's a good word. It's, to me, it's a word about epiphany. It is the text for epiphany. Um, and that has a lot to do with kind of opening our eyes, uh, laying something bare, um, and really revelation. And so um, our topic for today is the sense of revealing. I really think, agree or disagree, I really think as a culture, we have kind of nailed the art of the big reveal, the big reveal. Um, so your favorite TV show, for example, knows how to keep a huge secret and build up to it. And if it's the season finale or the season premiere, it is going to promise that if you tune in, you're going to find out, blah, blank. So some of y'all need to ask your parents who this guy is. Um, you're going to find something out. It's a big deal. Um, another kind of decent example, another version of the big reveal. Did you ever watch uh, Extreme, Hel Extreme Home Makeover? <laughs> this is like a few years ago, a bunch. Some of y'all watched it every week. My parents watched it every week. I'm like, why do y'all want to do that? Um, but it was a show about kind of a deserving family, a family with a really deserving story. And this professional kind of home uh, transformation crew would show up at their house, surprise them, sweep them off on vacation for, I think, a week. Yeah, one week. Okay, and while they were gone, they were going to totally renovate their home. And this is not just like change some colors. This is like just blow it up and do crazy stuff. Totally renovate. It's really cool. And the host was a little guy named Ty Pennington, just like this ball of energy. And he would lose his voice like every single week because he was that guy who just like had to amp everybody up all the time and had a bullhorn all the time. And so it was really fitting that the way the, the, the show ended each week, the conclusion was that they would kind of pull this family back out from vacation. They were blindfolded and they had a bus parked in front of the house to block their view and around them behind them was like this gigantic crowd of their family and friends and the construction workers and everybody and when the time was right they were you know took the blindfold off and this tour bus is, is in the way and ty in his usual way would kind of amp everybody up and he would say bus driver what's up good job so move that bus and it's a big deal and they move the bus and the family sees it and goes nuts and they start to cry, and everybody cries, and my parents would cry every single week. This is why I did not watch this show anymore, because it's just built to make this moment happen, okay? They're good. They're good at the big reveal. It's glorious. Um, just think about some of the ingredients to that, what makes for that moment. Um, as maybe a more personal example, uh, we even do this kind of thing in our personal lives. This is not just the professional media. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm glad. I'm pretty glad that Karen and I stopped, had stopped having our children and had our last child before the current trend that's become so popular hit, which is that you have to do amazing things when you reveal the sex of your unborn child, right? You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all have done this. Some of y'all are planning it. I mean, there are, there are businesses devoted to this. There are certainly websites. There are multiple Pinterest lists, multiple of like the 30 best reveals. I, you go look. I looked this week. And it's crazy stuff. You've got things like the standard staple of, you know, the cake. Yeah. You know, pink or blue. Boy or girl. Solid. Pretty, pretty low key. Well done. If that's all you're doing, it's not enough today. Um, you've got the, the box, the package, right? Oh, brother, sister, right? You involve the kid, the other sibling. Good job. Uh, you've got the volcano. Oh, sorry. Yep. The gender reveal volcano, not bad. If we can go back one, you've got the, not just the package and the balloons, but the balloons exploding out of the box with colored powder. Uh, you can keep going. Uh, you've got the target shoot. What's up? If you can see that. I guess it would take me like an hour to find out what. <laughs> People would die before I found out what that was. Uh, you've got the, go ahead. The Pokeball, what's up? See, y'all need to ask your children what that means. 
the purpose, the, my purpose here is that in the midst of all that, you're going to forget that you're having a baby and things are about to get real. So that's, that's good. But uh, we're talking about big reveal moments. So across those different examples, I, this is one of those I really want you to think and really answer out loud. Um, this is our act of worship, so be inappropriate. Um, what are some of the common ingredients across those things? What are some of the common threads that make for a proper big reveal? What's at work in some of those things? What do you see? What do you hear? You have to be really loud. There's some surprise involved, right? There's an anxiety, anticipation. What else? So make it a big occasion, big. There are lots of people involved. We invite a bunch of people. Um, there's waiting. You have to be patient. So the excitement builds. Yeah, what else? Social media. So we involve media to broadcast and share and reach an audience and show off and involve other people. What else? There's some secrecy in included in the surprise, which amps up our excitement, our attention. What else? Anything else? There's something hidden in something else. That's big. Because who doesn't want to see what's behind curtain number three or inside box number two? Yep. What else? There's some cost. Sometimes a ridiculous cost. Oh, maybe probably unethical cost. <laughs> uh, colored bazookas and stuff. Um, what else? There's preparation, time, energy. Um, some of these things, it's not just that time and excitement and anxiety builds, it's that we make it build. You see like multi-sensory stuff going on. There's colors and lights and sounds and booms and bangs. We know how to evoke a response from one another. As human beings, we know what stirs us up and juices us up and that you, you kind of craft this moment where all the excitement comes to a head and then it just, the big reveal happens. Yeah? Are you with me? So those are the ingredients to a, a really human reveal. Um, and that's a big deal because we're asking those questions because if an ancient you know, Palestinian person, a, a person from Jesus' day and time and location was here with us, um, they would have their own word to describe what we're talking about, these sort of big reveal moments. And their word was epiphania, epiphania, okay? Just so you know, it's kind of an old thing. There's the Greek, epiphania, which is epiphanies, okay? We're on Epiphany Sunday. Um, to the ancient Greeks, kind of on those rare occasions when um, the gods, one of the gods came to earth, to kind of rub elbows with mortals. And mortal people got to touch them, receive them, talk to them, do other crazy things with them. I'm talking about that. Um, and so on. They got to see them in their glory up close. You would say that that God had epiphanied. Okay? Shown itself, revealed itself in kind of a crazy way. Uh, the Romans, the Romans took that a step further. Are you with me? The Romans? We good on the history? All right, so the Romans took that a step further. They wanted the world to believe that their emperor was actually a god. It did them a lot of good. It made them seem more uh, menacing and powerful and unstoppable. It helped justify what they did and who they were. Um, it just was all good for them, for people to think the emperor was a god. And so to do that, the emperor would often, on special occasions, epiphany. The emperor would put together these huge moments, these kind of ceremonial appearances um, that would be announced way ahead of time. It would involve a lot of people. Um, and they would be buzzed about and prepared for for months at a time. The emperor's coming to our town. We might plan for it for like two years. Okay? Um, and there would be all sorts of hype ahead of time. There would be gladiator games and feasts and just crazy stuff to pump up the occasion. And then there would be uh, parades of soldiers and shows of force and might and trumpets and gold and flags and robes and regalia and just you name it and crowds chanting and kneeling and kind of doing all this stuff together and so do you hear some some common ingredients there to our own experience i'm not sure that your gender reveal party was as as done up as the emperor's epiphanies but there's some common common ground yes because these are the things that make for human reveal. But the question for us today is, is, are these the same things? Is this the same stuff of God's reveal? It's a big question. And the truth is, when it came to Jesus' birth as God's epiphany, um, there's some overlap. There's a little bit of overlap. Uh, for one thing, um, 
in the time of Mary and Joseph, there was like a great deal of anxiety and anticipation and hope and expectation. Your energy was high. Um, there was a great deal of longing for God to show up. That's not too different for us today. Um, there was a huge amount of cost for God to prepare for Jesus to come. There was a massive amount of preparation. You could say God had been preparing for Jesus to come since before the beginning of the universe. Massive preparation. We know that from heaven's perspective, there was indeed massive celebration and choirs singing and trumpets blasting and parades of armies of angels and all the stuff that we kind of catch glimpses of from the shepherds and other people in the story. So there's overlap. Uh, but the funny, the weird thing, the funny thing, in spite of all that, is that from Earth's perspective, from our perspective, things did look a lot different from the average epiphany, from a human epiphany. Because a person could actually, crazy, a person could actually somehow miss God's epiphany. It was possible to miss this. You weren't going to miss the emperor's epiphany by any means. You could miss God's. Um, so imagine the emperor of the universe comes to visit and comes to visit in a way that nobody ever thought possible. But an overwhelming majority of people from, from that place and from beyond missed it. They were clueless. It's weird. It's a little bit crazy. Matthew chapter 2 tells us that the people who were most supposed to kind of see God's epiphany and get it and welcome it were not very with it when it came to the epiphany. Um, Herod, King Herod, who had every kind of reason and resource to be on the watch for the Messiah's birth, um, he only suddenly cared when he perceived it as a threat. Yes, and perceived it as such a threat that Jesus to him, as he thought about it, became almost like a poison rather than the kind of antidote that Jesus really was. This is Herod's response. And then you've got his, his, his kind of religious leaders, the teachers, the scholars, the priests, who had every bit of the ancient knowledge and preparation to have been prepared to, to, to know exactly where to point out the baby. You know, we can flip through our pages. We, we too know where you can find the Messiah in Bethlehem. That's where he was always going to be born. But they don't seem to have the discernment to know that the time has come. They don't seem to have the desire to go along with them to see if this can be true. And if whatever the case, they weren't getting it, getting it. They weren't with it. But on the other side, on the flip side, um, those who were perhaps not supposed to get it, these very foreign and probably not uh, Jewish wise men, uh, they risk everything to come and ultimately to become some of Jesus' first disciples. Disciples of this little baby, poor Jewish boy. Crazy stuff. Which means to us, which is evidence to us that God's big reveal was pretty big geographically. It was pretty big that it could be noticed by somebody. Um, we see that it was born across the ages in prophecy and in writings. We see that the stars in the sky were trying to speak about it. And so it was noticeable to those who looked, who had eyes to see, and who had ears to hear, and who had hearts to know the truth, as Jesus said later. So it was possible. That is, you know, that is the core of the gospel. I mean, it's good news. That is good news, but it is also a little tough um, because the truth is, you know, God Almighty chose to come to us. You're not like a dictator and not like an emperor. Um, God didn't want a propaganda machine or like a giant army to come marching in to coerce our response. Instead, um, you know, God didn't rely on trumpets and fireworks and fancy stuff to kind of arouse our attention. Instead, he left us room to respond. Now, Jesus deserved all those things. Did Jesus deserve, did Jesus deserve the biggest it's a boy party ever conceived? What's up? Did Jesus deserve some blue powder in there? It's pretty, pretty easy. Okay, thank you. Yes. Maybe, maybe not, because I don't know what that even means. But yeah, Jesus deserved whatever fanfare Jesus could have received. Um, but instead, again, God came quietly enough 
that people were still left with a measure of decision. He left us room to still choose him with a willing heart or, frankly, to reject him. And so to this day, again, amazingly enough, weirdly enough, God still lets us, enables us, if we so choose, to ignore him. God lets us ignore him. Yes? God lets us put him off. God lets us get busy with other things. Uh, We can still choose today to miss the reveal or just to not get it. Um, We can even outright oppose God in order to cling to our own kingdoms and possessions and power like here. We have those options. They're on the table right now. Um, But to this day, God also lets anybody uh, near or far from any background or people or race or nation or behavior or history become his disciple, his primary disciples, even his children with just a little bit of faith. And that is, that is the gospel. It's tough in some ways and it's awesome and as amazing as it is. Um, the craziest part of it all, uh, no matter what we ever choose amongst those options, is that God personally suffered and died the way he did just to give us an option regardless of which one we would choose. And that, for me, that is how God epiphanies. It is not how a person or an emperor or some other foolish human would do it. 